Do you possess a high school diploma or GED? Yes, a GED. Are you at least 18 years old? I am, yes. Will you pass a drug test? Yes. Will you pass a criminal background check? No. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time, right, Brad. You have a good day. You too. Looking at how big and massive the city is, and, and it, it's just easy to get intimidated realizing that uh, you're only one among almost a few million people in one city that's trying to get the same thing that you're trying to get, a job and uh, some type of financial stability. Only difference, they don't have a record, and I do. So here, yeah, everything is requires money. It, it requires uh, that you have, you bring something to the table, and I have nothing to, to bring to the table right now. So I fit in it somewhere, but it's just a matter of where. So a few years ago, I got a call to be the director of photography on a documentary titled Land of the Free. And in that, I was tasked with following a man named Brian, the gentleman you just saw on the cliff. In 1989, Brian, as a teenager in LA, was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to live most of his life in prison. And after 24 years, Brian was released. Brian had every reason not to share his story with us. He was being released at the bottom of an uphill battle against labels as being a castaway, as being someone who missed that adolescent ship of potential. And for many with a criminal record, he had a scarlet letter on his back, deeming him the embodiment of qualities that we condemn. So as filmmakers, we had a goal of making a personal portrait and uh, in order to achieve that goal, we had to answer a very specific question. How do you tell a story about someone that society fears most? So the first few weeks, we started shooting and captured a lot of moments of someone who seemed to be stepping out of a time capsule. A lot has changed in the world since 1989. While locked away, the internet was invented, cell phones were popularized, 9-11 took place, amongst other globe-altering events. Brian was stepping out of the gates and had to completely recalibrate to a modern world of new cars, new technology, new societal norms. We filmed him taking his first sip of a fresh cup of coffee, learning to use a debit card at a 7-Eleven, going to his first job interview, asking someone at an internet cafe to describe to him how email works. But in these seemingly endless moments of firsts, Brian's story was soon eclipsed by something that was much deeper, a more universal story, a more truthful story, his quest for love, partnership, and affection. And if you could dim the lights. I'm longing for somebody just to not only be intimate with, but also who would be willing to allow me to express how I really feel inside as far as the pain and stuff like that. If you're sitting with the love of your life and you're around a warm fire, where you feel like it's okay to be vulnerable. I could just say, this is how I'm feeling, sweetheart. And you know that she's gonna love you regardless of what it is. She's gonna put her arms around you, she's gonna comfort you. And she's going to let you shed your tears, and she's going to let you just be Brian for that moment, you know? And I don't have that. So maybe I'm looking for a mom. I don't know. Or maybe just love her. Now. Allowing a camera to linger around you on a daily basis while you try and live your life is an easier thing said than done. 
Imagine a six foot tall blonde woman carrying a 20 pound camera, dancing around your space, 10 feet, three feet. You're doing great. I'm not here. Live your life, show me your truth. It's pretty awkward, right? <laughs> so one thing that requires is patience on his part. But another thing that's required is trust. Trust with a capital T, trust. If I fall, will you stand back? Will you grab my hand? If I take a shaky path, are you going to show me the way to a smoother road? Is there a way as a documentarian to do both? To have someone's back and not sacrifice the authenticity of their story and their experience. As a cinematographer, my job is to be technically proficient. But there's an unspoken responsibility to maintain the relationships around you, to memorize body language, try and predict the direction of a conversation, make snap decisions of what kind of narrative is really happening in a room, and what is the best placement of my body in the camera that portrays, most honestly, the perspective and experience of the character. If I shoot a wide shot, am I going to make someone look lonely in a room? If I shoot a close-up, am I forcing a sense of intimacy that a moment doesn't call for? Am I benefiting the story by being persistent, or am I damaging my relationships by being insensitive? One day, I was driving in the car with my director, Camilla McGid, and creative producer, Stina Fisher Christensen. And we were going to pick up Brian at the halfway house where he was living, where most people going through reentry are required to stay for a few weeks. And Brian hopped in the front seat, I had the camera on my shoulder, and I was ready to roll, ready to watch a scene unfold in front of us. But Camilla looked over at me, and she gave me the signal, set the camera aside. And so against all of my burning creative instincts, I took off the headphones and set the camera down. And in that moment, there was a new kind of interaction, an unfiltered interaction without the camera as the middleman. We shared stories on current events, asked Brian about experiences that he was having throughout the week. We joked around. We played the game of, where do you guys feel like eating? I don't know, it doesn't matter to me. Where do you feel like, I don't know, whatever. We as filmmakers had a responsibility to let our own walls down, tell our own stories, share our own values. And in those moments of, of telling Brian what our efforts were about the film, and being transparent about it, we also told him that we cared about him and that we were there as sounding boards for him. And it was in those moments that we began to pour that foundation of trust. Brian got his first job in a sports bar grill kitchen, washing dishes. And as I was setting camera up and he was scouring cookware, I started to watch his movements around the kitchen and began to notice rhythms in his mannerisms and tuned in to those subtle nuances and details that we shared, like the way he would have a conversation to himself in a room by himself, much like I secretly do the way he would wipe sweat off of his cheek, dimpled from acne scars, much like mine. One time we both had broken fingers for some reason, and we swapped and shared our battle stories. And so we continued on this seesaw of trust. And every time Brian would open up, we'd get a little bit deeper, and I would see his thoughts and his desires, and I would see myself in those my own values, my own goals, my own search for love. And we continued on with that dance. So in the next few years, we rolled through hundreds of hours, and we were welcomed into the most joyous of moments and some of the more uncomfortable situations, like when Brian, a 42-year-old adult man, asked a woman out on the date for, the, for his very first time or when he excitedly told us about his first physical intimate experience with a woman at a drive-in movie theater the night before. 
or when we sat in a hotel room with our hearts pounding, waiting for him to see his mom for the first time in 14 years. Brian gave us the gift of his most vulnerable experiences in real time, and in turn, we got to vicariously live his ride. Now, I came to talk to you guys today because I had an experience. We set out to lens an intimate portrait, and in order to do that and tell the story truthfully and break down those walls for our audience, we had to, as individuals, go through the trials of breaking down those walls ourselves. And I think this is just a magnified example of something that we're confronted with on a regular basis, on many different scales. Every day we have opportunities to make judgments or to try and understand each other in small talk, in comment sections, in the news, standing in line, with distant family members or with stories that we hear of people in their lives on the other side of the world. I once heard that if you talk to someone for five minutes, you'll find out that you have something in common. If you talk to them for another five minutes, you'll find out that you have something else in common. If you give someone the benefit of the doubt and make that small effort, I guarantee you will find a quality that you share. And in seeing bits of yourself reflected in others, passing judgments not only becomes a more difficult thing to do, those judgments often become totally irrelevant. And I don't think anyone here needs a lesson on the importance and the rewards of empathy, connection, and compassion. So I want to thank Brian for letting us tell his story and thank everyone involved in the team to making that small effort together. Thank you, guys.